All right, so we'll, we'll be continuing chapter 13 in this video. Let me start with just to kind of summarize what we've done, what we've said so far. Let's do one of our uh, diagrams. We have rings, the set of all rings. So all kinds of different kinds of rings here. Within that set, we've got, this is too big, but commutative rings. And also within the set of rings, we have rings with a special unity element, a, a multiplicative identity element. Now they may or may not be commutative, so there'll be some overlap here. Uh, let me be careful with how big I draw it. <laughs> need to have space to draw it within it. So that the sizes are deceptive here, but we have rings with unity. So these would include like our matrix rings, the two by two integer matrices, two by two real number matrices, three by three integer matrices, et cetera. Uh, so you have non-commutative rings with unity. We could also have commutative rings with unity. Within that, we've got uh, integral domains. So integral domains are commutative. They have a unity element but they have a stronger condition of not having these things we call zero divisors. So these include things like the integers, they include integer polynomial rings, and other things we mentioned last time. And then within integral domains, there's a very, very small set. Uh, I don't know if I have enough space to write it, fields. So within that small bubble, I'd write fields. I'd have to make it bigger so I can write it. So fields. So fields are as good as it gets. They are a ring that has all of the properties that we have wanted. They're commutative, they have unity, they have no zero divisors, but the reason they have no zero divisors is actually because they act they have multiplicative inverses. Right. Uh, so getting to my first point in this, this new video, we we know that every field is an inner domain. It is not true that every integral domain is a field. There are things that are here but not here, like the integers or the integer polynomials. Those aren't fields. However, there is one thing we can say, and this is the theorem. This is a theorem. If we'll call it D is a finite integral domain, then D is a field. So keyword is here's finite. Not every integral domain is a field, but any finite integral domain is a field. So in other words, we cannot come up with a finite example of an integral domain which is not also a field. Okay, so let's prove this. The, the theorem is not that important for us. Uh, the proof is nice just because it's an application of the last thing we proved last time about the, the cancellation problem, uh, the ca cancellation property of inner domains. Um, so here's what we do. Let D be a finite inner domain. We need to show, to show it's a field. So let's just Then if it's, it's if it shows a field, shows a field, we have three things we have to check. It needs to be commutative. It needs to have a unity element, and then every non-zero element has to have an inverse. 
Two of those things are free, though. In an inner domain, part of the definition of an ID is it's commutative. Uh, part, another part is it has a unity. So the only remaining thing to prove is that if I have a non-zero element, I need to be able to find an inverse for it, a multiplicative inverse. So let A be an element of B with A not equal to zero. And here, I, I should have said this last time. I've, I've, I was careless in the last video. On these, when they're talking about rings and inner domains and fields, when I write zero or one, I really mean the zero element or the one element. So I'm, I'm neglecting to put a subscript on it. This is zero sub D. Okay, or zero sub R if my ring is called R. All right, so A is not the zero element. I need to find its inverse. So let's look at powers of B. Sorry, powers of A. <laughs> so if I take a power of A, so A to the K, doesn't equal zero D because D is an integral domain and as we talked about before, as, as I talked about before, no, the, no zero divisor property can be thought of a couple different ways. One way is if I have non-zero elements and I multiply them, I get a non-zero element. Well, here I have a product it consists only of A's, A times A times A times A, K times, each A is the same, none of them are zero. So I'm multiplying a bunch of non-zero things, so I can't get the zero element out of it. So this is because D, I'll say has no zero divisors. And A is non-zero. All right, so if I look at for for any this is for any k in the integers here, well, I guess for it to make sense, it has to be a positive integer because I can't have negative exponents if I don't have inverses yet. So for k and a natural number a to the k is not zero. All right, so now consider just the list. a, a squared, a cubed, a to the fourth, and so on forever. None of these are zero. But more than that, d is finite. Here I have, I've started listing something that, that will go on forever. So I'm, I'm listing potentially infinitely many elements. However, I'm in a finite set. So if this list goes on forever, I have to start repeating elements. So since D is finite, this list must have repetitions. In other words, there exists, uh, we'll call it i and j in the natural numbers with a, a, or i is not equal to j. We'll say i is less than j. i is less than j with a to the i equals a to the j. So different powers of a represent the same element of the ring. Is what this is saying. Right? So I have to erase because I'm out of space. Um, but here, I'll just I'll tell you the next step before I erase. A to the i equals a to the j. A is not zero. And in an in a in an integral domain, we have the cancellation property. I can cancel common factors that are not zero. 
So I can cancel a's from both sides of this equation until I run out of a's. So let's write that down. Or in other words, I've got this equation. Let me start with that. So I've got to here. Uh, since a i a to the i is not zero, cancel a to the i from both sides. Then we get when I cancel all of the a's on, on this side, I'm left with nothing, but that means I have one. So a to the a, sorry. 1 sub d is what I'm left with on the right. Uh, on the left, on the right, if I cancel i a's, I'm left with a to the j minus i. Okay, so now we're almost done. Think back to what we're trying to do. We want to show that this is a field, so we were trying to show that a, the non-zero element a, has a multiplicative inverse. And I'm almost there. I have a product of a's that give me one. They give me the unity. So that product of a's, I can peel off an a, and now I have a times something else gives me one. So we have one sub d equals a times a to the j minus i minus one. So I just take, take one of the a's and treat that by itself and leave the rest of them there. So therefore, a to the j minus i minus 1 is a multiplicative inverse for a. So therefore, a is a unit. So therefore, d is a field. We've shown that for any arb for any arbitrary non-zero element, we can find a multiplicative inverse. That's what's required to be a field. Every non-zero element has to have a multipli multiplicative inverse. Okay. So I just want to do that proof because it was kind of illustrative of certain ideas of, of how do we prove some of these things, how do we prove something's a field. Now I want to change course a little bit. We're still in the same section, um, but I want to introduce another definition. Like, like I said a couple of videos ago, when we, ring theory is just, has all kinds of definitions. <laughs> Most of the time is spent explaining the meaning of definitions. Um, so the next one is, is a, the characteristic of a ring. Let R, let R be, a, be a ring. Let R be a ring. Its characteristic is denoted by char r, or char of r, characteristic of r. And this is always, this is a tricky definition to write. Uh, it's the least positive integer in such that n times a equals 0 sub r for all a in r. If no such integer exists, 
then the characteristic of R is defined to be zero. Now this, here's why we really have to be careful with this zero sub R stuff. This zero is the integer zero. This zero is the zero element of the ring. Okay, so let, let's look at some examples. So the characteristic it's very it's it's very much it's very similar to the order of an element in a group. Like in a group, the order of an element is the number of times you have to apply that element when you get to, to get back to the identity element. Uh, the characteristic of a ring, though, that, that's a ring-wide. Uh, don't want to say characteristic. It's a, it's a ring. It's a property of the entire ring. It's a number that applies for the entire ring. So let's look at an example. So let's compute the characteristic of Z4. So I have four elements, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So basically what I want to do is I want to look at all the multi all the integer multiples of these numbers. So and, and I want to stop when I get to zero. So let me list them here. The integer multiples. Ah, uh, sorry. Integer multiples. Let me give myself one more row here. Okay, so these are integers here. I want to add each of these ring elements this many times. So zero, I guess I don't need to start with zero. Sorry. I don't, I don't need to worry about zero because we're looking for positive integers. So zero, one time is zero. Zero plus zero is still zero. Zero plus zero plus zero, so three zeros is still zero. Four zeros is still zero. So zero, there's no issue. It, it's always going to be zero. If I keep adding ones, well, one plus one by itself is one. One plus one, so two times one, that's two. Three times one, that's three. Four times one is zero because we're working mod four. Now two. One times two is two. Two times two is four, but mod four, that's zero. Three times two is six, mod four, that's two. Four times two is eight, eight mod four is zero. Now three, one times three is three, two times three is six, mod four is two, three times three is nine, mod four is one, four times three is 12, mod four, that's zero. So the characteristic of the ring is the first time where my entire uh, entire column is zero, and every every single ring element ends up as zero with that multiple. So for Z four, the characteristic is four, because when I multiple when I take four of any element added together, I always get zero. Okay. However. I can't make a table, obviously, but if I did the integers, the characteristic of the integers, if you just look at the multiples of one, so that's just going to be counting, right? One, two, three, four, five, and so on. There's no modding, so if I keep adding in the integers, I'm never going to get back to zero. I'm just going to keep getting bigger and bigger forever. So in that case, we, def we specially define the characteristic to be zero. Okay, So in general, the characteristic of a, of a ring needs to be a non-negative integer. The only time it is zero is when you can find an element that will never make it back to the zero element, no matter how many times you add it. All right. Um, Let's do 
Another example here. Z2 plus Z3. So the, the, the direct sum, Z2 plus Z3. All right, so there's six elements here. Like I said before, <clears throat> I don't really care about the, the zero element. It's always going to be zero. No matter how many times I add the zero element, I get zero. So let's write the non-zero elements. There's just going to be five of them. I've got one, zero, one, 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 two, zero, one, and zero, two. Okay, I also have the, the zero, zero, but that's the zero element. Okay, I'm not going to make a table because there's too many of them. But let's think about for each of these. Uh, oh, what's the best way of doing this? How am I going to get zero by addition? Well, if it's one zero, if that's my starting element, and I keep adding it, the only thing that's changing is the first coordinate. And the first coordinate, that's done mod 2. So if I add this once, or if I add it twice, so two of these would be 0, 0. If I have three of them, then I have 3, 0, but the 3 is mod 2, so that becomes 1, 0 again. If I have 4, I would have 4 mod 2, which would be 0. So this is 0. Uh, let me do it like this. In times this equals zero zero when n is even because in the first coordinate I'm doing uh, mod two let's go down to zero one if I keep adding that so n times zero one that'll equal zero zero the zero element when well now the second coordinate that's what's changing and there we're doing mod three. So I will get a zero in the second coordinate when I have a multiple of three there, essentially. So this is when n is a multiple, uh, is divisible by three. Uh, let's see, same with this, zero, two. So the only way I'll get a zero in that second coordinate here is if n times two is a multiple of three, but two can't contribute to three. It's, it's a prime number, it's not divisible by three. So the only way I'll get a multiple of three there is if n is a multiple of three. So same thing, divisible by three. Okay, so for these other two, So without modding n times 1, 1, that's n, n. But now in the first coordinate, I need to mod by 2. And in the second coordinate, I need to mod by 3. So when will I get 0, 0? That'll happen when n is both a multiple of 2 and a multiple of 3. So this will happen when n is divisible by 6. It's divisible by 2 and by 3, so it's divisible by 6. The same thing's going to be true about 1, 2. Uh, okay, so you look at all these conditions. When is the first time that any of these would be 0? What, what is the first integer that will work for any of these? Well, it has to be even. It has to be divisible by three, and it has to be divisible by six. That's to satisfy all three of those conditions. Well, six does it. So the, the characteristic of this would be six. Okay, so. In general, The 
if I've got two of these, for example, characteristic of ZM plus ZN, that's going to be the least common multiple of M and N. So two and three gives me six. Okay, so we're going to talk more about characteristics. But before we get to really prove anything about them, as this, this last example I hope illustrated, it's really, it's, it's kind of a pain to determine the characteristic of a ring by thinking about every possible element and how many times you have to add it to get to zero. Okay, so I, I can't really do that if there's infinitely many elements anyway. So you have to either come up with a way of seeing it or in a specific type of ring, there's a faster way of doing it. So let me write that theorem down. Um, I don't think I'll prove it, but let, let me let me tell you the theorem. If R is a ring with unity, let's call it one sub R, then I can compute the characteristic of R basically by just thinking about the unity element. So, I guess I have to do two cases. It is the, uh, well, it's the the least positive integer in such that n times 1 sub r equals 0 sub r. So if I can find an, uh, if I can find the first integer that works for 1, that's all I have to check. I don't have to worry about the rest of the ring elements. And then the characteristic of R is zero if no such integer exists for one. Okay, so let, let me illustrate this. So I'm not, not going to prove that this is true. It's a fairly simple proof. It's just kind of a mess to write down, especially on a limited whiteboard like this. Let me just show you how we can use this um, for some examples. So if, if you didn't believe me about the, the ZM plus ZN stuff, suppose I had, let's do a more complicated one. We have Z5 plus, uh, sorry, not Z5, uh, let's do Z, Z Z2 plus Z4. Okay, so we already know what the answer should be because I, I told you the rule. But suppose I wanted to compute it from scratch, except we, we can use that last theorem. So this is a ring with unity. So the unity element here is 1, 1. A 1 in both coordinates. So now what I'm saying is I just have to look at the multiples of this, the integer multiples of this. So 1 times this is 1, 1. 2 times this is this plus itself. So that's going to be, well, in the first coordinate, 1 plus 1 is 0. In the second coordinate, 1 plus 1 is 2. And now I'm just going to keep adding 1, 1s to this. So the next one will be 1, 3. And then the next one, 4 times 1, 1. Well, I'm adding another 1, 1. So 1 plus 1 gives me 0 in the first coordinate because it's mod 2 there. 3 plus 1 in the second coordinate is 0 mod 4. 
And so I got to the zero element. Zero, zero is the zero element. And it took four applications of this unity. So the characteristic of Z2 plus Z4 is four. Okay, I don't have to worry about the rest of the elements because once it works for one, it'll work for the rest. I guess, let me, it's not a proof, but let me show you why it works. That the key observation about, uh, so here's why the, the theorem works. So suppose, Suppose that n times 1r is 0r. I basically need to show that that n will work for any other element. So another element a, n times a is the same thing as n times 1a. And I better be careful about it. Uh, n times 1a. Yeah. So let's, let's write out what that means. Since, since we have to be careful with the multiplication here. Remember, n's an integer. 1a is a ring element. So this multiplication is really a, a repeated addition. So this is 1a plus 1a plus 1a plus 1a n times. Well, I can factor out an A from that. Like that. But now this, there's, there's N of these ones. That by definition is N times 1. But N times 1, these are, one, these are all 1 sub R's. I guess I should be careful since I'm dealing with integers and ring elements here. n times 1r is 0r. So I have 0r times a. That's 0r. That's that's the 0 element. So once, this, once we kill off 1, once we find an integer that kills 1, that integer will kill anything else. It's, it's a violent metaphor for, for ring theory. Okay, um, so with, now with this new fact, let's, let's look at a few more examples. So let's suppose R has unity. Let me actually amend that. I'm going to have multiple abstract examples here. Let's have R and S be rings with unity, R rings with unity. OK, so let's just go through one at a time here. If I have a polynomial ring, Rx, and I want its characteristic, it's the same thing as the characteristic of R. And why is that? Well, what is the unity in the polynomial ring? It's the polynomial that has no x's. It just has the 1. It has a constant term of 1. Well, the unity here is the same thing. So R and Rx, basically, they have the same unity element. It's just here I'm thinking of it as a constant polynomial, whereas here I'm thinking of it as a specific ring element. Uh, but in any case, if I keep adding it, if n times 1 is 0 here, n times 1 is 0 here. OK, so that the two are equal. So for example, let's just illustrate with a specific 
polynomial ring. Suppose I had Z3x. The characteristic of that's the same thing as the characteristic of its coefficient ring, which is Z3, which is 3. And so what that means is if I take anything in Z3x, like say I have x squared plus 2x plus 1, that's a polynomial in Z3. If I add it three times, so I multiply it by the integer 3, that's going to give me 3, but my, my remember, my addition is done mod 3. 3x three squared, that would really be 0x squared. 2 plus 2 plus 2, 6, mod 3, that's 0x. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, but mod 3, that's 0. So 3 times this polynomial is 0. So in other words, to kill off a polynomial, I just need to simultaneously kill off every single coefficient. But the characteristic of the coefficients will do that. 3 does that. All right, so that's polynomials, polynomial rings, um, matrix rings. Well, let's do two by two matrices. The characteristic of a matrix ring is also the same as the characteristic of the underlying ring. Uh, so again, like if I do matrices with Z3 entries, that has characteristic 3. Because if I take any, any matrix with Z3 entries, if I multiply that matrix by 3, so if I add it 3 times, that's going to kill off all, all 4 slots. 3 times 1 mod 3 is 0. 3 times 2 mod 3 is 0. 3 times 2 is 0. 3 times 0 is 0. So matrix, the, making, forming a matrix ring also preserves the characteristic. Oops, did all that. So R and S are unities, are rings with unity. And the reason I put S was for this next statement. If I have a direct sum of rings, the characteristic is just like with the example earlier with, with Z2 plus C3 or whatever, it's the least common multiple of their individual characteristics. Because I have to, if I take 1, 1, I have to simultaneously kill off 1 in both places. Well, it takes a multiple of the characteristic of R to do it in the first coordinate. It takes a multiple of the characteristic of S to do it in the second coordinate. Uh, so, for example, let me do a couple examples. Uh, um, I guess I can't do it. Uh, Z3x and M. Oh, sorry. The direct sum of these two things. Z3x plus M2Z4. So we want to figure out the characteristic of each of these. Here it's 3, here it's 4. So it's the least common multiple of 3 and 4, which would be 12. Okay, so that's simple enough. Uh, I do want to mention um, Something like this. So I've got the, the real numbers plus Z5. So Z5 has characteristic 5. What's the characteristic of the real numbers? Well, think about the unity element, 1. 
if I keep adding ones in the real numbers, I'm never going to get back to zero. Doesn't matter, matter how many times I add one in the real numbers, I'll never get zero. So that characteristic would be zero. If I never get back to zero, the characteristic is zero. Okay, so then what's the least common multiple of zero and five? Well, every multiple of zero is zero, so the least common multiple is zero. Okay, so this characteristic stuff is taking a lot more time than I was expecting. Um, I think it'll take me mo more than 10 minutes to fi finish the rest of what I want to say with the characteristics. So let me end the video a little bit, or end it now. Um, I will continue talking about characteristics in the next video and then move on to some other concepts which I will decide on before then.